All right, gang. We are going to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I'm reading from the NIV. And uh, this is a series that I've wanted to bring you for a long, long time. I, uh, I have felt that uh, God had something in here to give you. I have waited until now to give it. I feel like we're in a place, we're in a place to receive it. Do you feel like we're, do you realize where we are right now? Is anybody feeling what I'm feeling? Yes. Because, because there's change in the air and God's bringing us somewhere. He's, he's bringing us to a place to be able to receive that and be able to step into it fully. And so this series, which is, it's going to be uh, three weeks long, and um, David's last message is going to cut into that third week of it, but we'll do that the next week, first, uh, first week of November. But this is the thing. I want you to understand that we're in a very, we're in an amazing place right now. Does anybody feel like it's been a little bit of a journey to get here? <laughs> Anybody, you know, feel like you had to... <laughs> like, did you get the name of that truck, the license plate on the truck that just ran me over five times, backed up over me four? Uh, that may be how you feel. I know that that's how I feel. But we're in the place that God has wanted us to get to. And so now is the time to begin to press in further. Amen. I do want to say, too, it's good to have Glenn and Janet here with us. Amen. Always good to have you guys. Love you a lot. Pray that this blesses you and encourages you as you go. Let's go. Uh, verse 15, NIV. Paul writes, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Anyone want to know him better? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people and his incar in incomparably, excuse me, his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is seen as, the power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in any way. Isn't that an exciting portion of scripture? We're going to get into this over this next couple of weeks. We're going to go today, though. We're focusing on verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Amen. This, uh, this text is, is, um, is one that's really close to my heart. If I, have, if I have a life verse, if I have a life series of verses, this is it. This is, in, from what I understand from the Lord, this is, this is my calling is to bring us to all of this place. But that is, that is not just my life verse. It is for all of us. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians after a time of just intense uh, persecution. If you don't know the story about the Thessalonian church, Paul gets uh, the Macedonian call. Anybody know what the Macedonian call was? Okay, Paul is... is uh, Paul is praying one day, and all the doors are shutting. 
I've been, I've been in that place. All the doors are shutting. It's like nothing's working. He tries to go into Asia. That doesn't work. He tries to, to go into um, different areas. And, and everywhere it says that this, either the spirit of the Lord prevented him or that, that he was forbidden to go there. And, and so God is literally shutting him down. And he's seeking direction from the Lord as what to do. And all of a sudden he has a dream at night. And he sees a man from Macedonia. In his dream, and, and the man says, come, help us. And so Paul gets up the next day, and he starts making for the region of Macedonia, of which the Thessaloniki, the city, was the capital. It was the capital of the region. And so Paul goes in, and Scripture says that for three weeks he reasoned with those that were at the uh, at the synagogue, he's, he's talking to them how Jesus is the Christ and that he had to die and be raised again to defeat sin, Satan, and death. And, and he's reasoning with them for three weeks and then all of a sudden they just, they just shut the doors on him. And so he takes his little crew and they go out and they start their own little church and it starts growing, God starts moving and, and they begin to equip the people with the gospel. And all of a sudden... He he's, comes under persecution and kicks them out. He ends up having to go then to Philippi and then to uh, Corinth and then to Ephesus after that. God used all of those things to set up a people here in Ephesus that were strong. What's interesting, there's only two, there's only two churches in the entire New Testament that don't really have like these glaring like Warning signs of like, we are in major trouble. Paul's writing like, you know, stop doing that, start doing this. And there's all these correctives in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, every other letter except for the Thessalonian correspondence, Thessalonians 1 and 2, and Ephesians. Everybody else is in a boatload of trouble except for these two churches. And the Thessalonian church is a young church, but the Ephesian church grows deep grows strong because Paul's there for a long time. And what's amazing is Paul begins to lay out in the Ephesian church who the church is supposed to be. If you read the book of Ephesians, there's no book that's so complete in its, in its um, expression of what we're supposed to be doing, what we're called to be. There's no other book that's like it. And so in this book now, we're, we're picking up the introduction here. And Paul wants us, first off, the ground floor is that he wants us to begin to know God. To know God. See, Paul's writing and he says that he really wants for you to really know God. Not to know about God. Not to know the stories about God. Not to know just things about God. Facts. Ideas. He wants you to know him. He wants you to not just even just know him like, hey, we've met. You know, yeah, I know Jesus. You know, like, I mean, I know, I know Chris Spielman, who's uh, on the TV for football every week. I know him, but I don't call him. I don't hang out with him. I don't go, hey, Chris, I'm going to be in Columbus. You want to go out for pizza? That's not the way it is, but I know him. That's not how we need to know Jesus. He wants it to be more than just a casual relationship. He wants it to be more than just something that you just kind of, yeah, I know him. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know him like you know your best friend. He wants you to know him like you know your wife, gentlemen, or you know your husbands, ladies, or how you know your brothers, daughters, sisters. You might not want him to know him that well. Your brothers... I know how that works. You want to know him better than you know your brother, I promise you that. See, but God doesn't want us just to simply know about him or know things about him or, or just have met him. He wants you to know him. The reality is that if you want to know my story, what got me into Pentecost, got me into the full gospel movement, was that my best friend Mark told me that, that it wasn't about going to church. It was like, David, you could know God. You could know Jesus. And I said, wait a second. You're saying I could know him? Like really know him? And he said, yes. 
See, what Mark didn't know is that I was raised Baptist. I was raised as a good Baptist kid. I wasn't always a good Baptist kid, but that's how I was raised. <laughs> and, and, and at 16 years old, I decided that I wanted to read through the New Testament. I decided that I really wanted to, to begin to understand Jesus, to know him better. And I remember getting to Mark. And I'm reading in Mark about how the, the disciples are going out and they're healing people. And they're, they're seeing devils cast out and all this stuff's going on. And I remember sitting there with my Bible open in my lap in my bed, looking up at my ceiling and talking to the Lord. And I said, if I could know you like they knew you, I would serve you. But since I can't, because that's what I was told, I won't. And I closed the book, and I put it down, and I didn't pick it up for eight years. See, but that is not the reality of what God wants for you. The Lord heard the prayer of that 16-year-old boy, and back eight years later, leads me to a, a, a man who, who brought me into a church kind of like this one, where people maybe run up front and worship and raise their hands and cry and pray and dance. And maybe you might see somebody run or roll sometime. I don't know what's going to happen. But see, it's a living thing. This is not a religion. This is not a social club. You don't have to, you know... Make so much money to come here. You don't have to be a certain status to be here. We want everybody. We want everybody. We want everybody. I don't care what you look like, smell like, anything else. I want you here. We want you here because we know that what we've got is more than just some simple gathering on Sunday to talk about some interesting ideas. We have the living God. We have the one crucified to save the world. He's here. And because he's here, anything can happen. Anything can happen. Look around you. Some of you, y'all grew up together. Most of y'all know everybody's history. You could write a book on your person sitting next to you, most likely. You know where they've been, when do they graduated from high school, what their rank was in their class, for goodness sake. But see, some of you know the story. But you, now you see where God's brought them from. We're not, this isn't, this isn't a bunch of good ideas. This is life. This is life. That's what we have to give. That's all that we have to give. See, but Paul wants, Paul wants you to not just simply even just know that, but he wants you to know more. He wants you to know more. God wants through you to bring him into the world. But to do that, we're going to have to know him more, know him better, and walk with him closer. Paul wrote, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father. Everyone say glorious Father. Glorious Father. The glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Yeah. See, it's important to understand how big of a deal this is. To God and to Paul. See, when, when Paul writes this, it's illustrated, the importance of it is illustrated in how he says it. There's lots of places in the scripture where God talks about the Lord, or excuse me, Paul talks about God's glory. There's lots of places where he talks about Jesus and even his glory. But this is the only place in scripture that he is referred to as the glorious father or the Father of glory. He frequently speaks of the glory of God once. Once he does also say that it's the glory of the Father in Romans 6, 4, but never, never in anywhere else in the scriptures does he say the Father of glory, except here. In other words, what he's praying into us is not just simply even the knowledge that, that just is, is in the New Testament church. He wants us to get a deeper revelation. He wants us to understand really his nature, that, that just out of him is glory. He wants you to see a vision where you literally come into contact with the Shekinah of God. 
For anyone who doesn't know what the Shekinah was, that was the presence of the Lord over the mercy seat. That was the glowing presence of God that dwelt between the two angels on the head of the mercy seat. That is the glory of God, and that is what God wants you to find. He wants you to come into contact with his glory, his Shekinah. Paul does want you to know God, yes, but he wants these people and us to find the rarest of revelations of who he is. He wants you to see God for truly what he is. Tell you what, let's ask God for that right now. Each of us, let's just pray for just a moment. Father, show me truly, truly who you are. Let me see your glory. Let me see the glorious Father. Let me see the Father of glory. Let me fully comprehend, fully know, fully understand what that means, Lord, in Jesus' name. To do that, it must come through a spirit of revelation. What I want you to understand is, is that God needs to be able to bring it to you through the Holy Spirit. It's only through that, that personal spirit of God that lives inside of you that God can begin to tap these things and, and bring you to new understandings. I want you to understand something. And this came up this last week. Somebody, uh, we were talking about theology, a, a friend of mine and I, and, and this friend had talked about how somebody had said to, to them recently that, that, um, that God was going to work on their theology. And uh, the problem with that was that the friend was a preacher, and, and they felt a little weird about that. But I, I said this. I said, just so you understand, God's working on all of our theology. <laughs> That's right. Because ain't none of us here who got the full understanding of who Jesus is. There's nobody in the room that's got a full comprehension of who God is. That's why this prayer is here. That's why we just prayed what we prayed. Because I don't know about you, but I want more. I love the song that Amy sang today. And by the way, sorry about my headset falling off. I couldn't hear anything but crashing cymbals. If you, if you, notice, if you notice the drums just went, whew. it wasn't because I was lost in spirit. I was lost trying to find my headset. <laughs> which is a real pain, I'll tell you what. So anyway, the thing is, is that, that, that we, we need more revelation to step into what it is that God really wants for us to really understand him, to really know him, because then, understand this, when you step into knowing who he really is, past all of our precepts, past all of our, our, our misconceptions, because we all got them, when we step into who he is, then all of a sudden, the, the, the playing field opens up. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's going on? You know how to negotiate through it. You see how God sees, and suddenly you can move in a dimension that you've never been able to move before, because you've begun to tap into who he really is. So that is what God wants for us, to bring us into that place through this two-way relationship in his spirit. In his spirit. In his spirit. Now I want to say this. There are people in the room that maybe feel like you, you feel a little bit of fear when you think about coming close to God. There's a lot of times that depending on how you were raised or, or what things you've done or, or whatever, that there's a fear that's, that's about coming close to God. Because hear this, the reason that we fear coming close to God at times is because we're scared of being rejected by him. We're scared of his judgment. We feel like, you know, you ever talk to somebody and ask them to come to church? They're like, oh man, if I show up to your church, the building would cave down, you know, cave in on me. Lightning would strike. I always tell them, hey man, it's all good. We got a lightning rod up there. We're good. <laughs> We're grounded, that's right. See, but, but the thing is this, there's, there's this fear of rejection. And, and, and the, 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 the thing is that that can be someone who doesn't know the Lord yet. And sometimes that's us who know the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Here's just a thought. How long does it take you between when you sin and repent and when you pray again? Because I'll, I'll tell you something, the gap, however wide it is, is the indication of how rejected you feel by God. Did you get that? Yeah. 
The gap between your repentance and asking for forgiveness for what you sinned and talking to God again is the gap that reflects your level of rejection that you feel from God. But see, this is the thing. As soon as you ask for forgiveness, he's, all right, let's go. He's like, all right, all right, that was dumb, but we're picking up the pieces, we're good. Let's go. See, God, God has that, that disability in our minds because of the effects of, of, of misconceptions that hold us back. So that's why we got to tear these things down. That's why when, when I'm 16 too, different misconception, not of rejection, but of, of lack of opportunity. It was the lack of opportunity and the lack of good teaching in some ways that prevented me from being able to step into what God had for me right then at 16. It was the same thing. It's the same stinking thing that holds you back from stepping into all that God's got for you now. That's why some of us feel like God couldn't use me. You don't know how I struggle. Are you human? Then I know how you struggle. Because we're all the same. See, but this is the thing. What I don't allow and what we need to not start allowing, we need to change our minds and a spirit of revelation and understanding. Lord, let it come now. Let it come now that we would understand that, that when we sin, yeah, you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to confess your sin and ask the Lord to forgive you. But as soon as you get done, as soon as there's the period at the end of the sentence, you're moving forward. Because, because God wants to use you in ways you can't begin to understand. And as long as you hold in your own mind and heart this, this, this standard that you have to perform up to before he can use you, you will never be used. But see, it's not about you. I didn't get up here today because I'm good enough. Jackie, I didn't even get up here today because I had a cute pair of boots on. I got up here today because I'm here to fulfill my calling in the kingdom. And each of us in this room, no matter what's going on in your life right now, you have a, 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 a ministry, a place that you have to fulfill in the kingdom. And that the sooner you stop trying to measure up to someone else's idea that they gave you of what you've got to be to qualify to step into those things, the sooner you're going to begin to see God use you in impossible ways. It's not how cute you are, how good you look if you bathe this morning. It's not whether or not you sin this morning yet. It's your calling. It's your place in the kingdom. Amen. Tell you what, just receive that for a moment. Just lift your hands and just receive that word. Just receive, Father, in Jesus' name, just put that in us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. See, Jesus is the image of God. Hebrews 1.3 says that he is the expressed image of God. There's other portions of scripture that says um, that, that literally in, in John 1, it says how, how Jesus revealed the Father. In other words, when you look at Jesus, he is the living expression of God. He is what God looks like living in the world. He is the image of God animated, made alive before us. Jesus went so far as to say in, in John 14 when he's talking to Philip, he said, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so if you want to know how God responds to us as human beings, as fallen people who struggle with sin, who deal with issues, if you want to know how, G how God deals with us, look how Jesus dealt with people. That is how he wants to deal with you. The heart of God is revealed in Jesus. And anything that doesn't look like Jesus is not how God looks. A lot of us in this room have experienced a whole lot less 
than the image of God in religion. Can I get an amen? I heard it said once that we're the only army that shoots our wounded. That will never be the case here. Understand that. We will never do that here. We are going to love everybody through their junk because that's what the kingdom is about. And when we do, we're going to see redemption. We're going to see healing. We're going to see God move in power. We're going to see lives that are broken, made whole. We're going to see healing in families that are busted up and destroyed. We're going to see God do it. Because we're going to look like Jesus. The heart of Jesus is revealed in his love for sinners. Read through your Bible and look at the stories and listen to the things that Jesus did. He, he takes the woman caught in adultery and, and, and declares her forgiven in the midst of all of her accusers. He heals the centurion's servant who's sick. He, he meets the woman at the well from Samaria and he, he gives her, really, it's the first person. Do you realize this? For all of you who know what Samaritans were, Samaritans were like the rejected kind of half-breed Jews. They were like Jewish, but they were, they were intermingled from the, the, uh, the Gentiles that had been placed there by the Babylonians when they took the Jews out of, out of Israel. And so they're a very rejected, persecuted, like prejudiced against people. And Jesus goes to a well and meets a Samaritan woman. He's not supposed to talk to women, first of all, because he's a man. And then he's not supposed to talk to Samaritans because he's a Jew. And then he, he breaks both those rules and he's talking to her. And it's the first, get this, it's the first person, this is the first person in record of the scriptures that he says, I'm the Christ. The most rejected, the woman who had five husbands back when it wasn't cool to have more than one, right? Like right now it's almost fashionable, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's my third husband. It's like a status symbol or something stupid. No, five hum husbands, and she's living with the dude, and, and she goes at the well at midday when nobody else will be there because she's been so rejected, even by her own people, and God chooses her to say, oh, yeah, the, the Messiah who you're waiting for, I am he. Does anybody feel rejected in here? I'm telling you this. Jesus came today for you. He goes on. He heals blind Bartimaeus. He, he heals the lame man at the pool of Shalom. He heals the blind man who washed his eyes in the pool of Bethesda. He heals the leper. I do want to get into this story for just a minute. He heals a leper in Matthew. Eight. Now, if you don't know what leprosy was like in the old world, what happened was you'd get leprosy, and people know about leprosy, like it's degenerative to your skin. What it actually does, it kills all the nerves in, in your body parts, your extreme, extremities, and, and because of that, star, stuff starts to like fall off, because you, you bump it, and, and, and you get it cut, and you don't even realize it's cut, and all of a sudden it gets infected, and all of a sudden like that gets gangrenous, it gets gangrene, and all of a sudden stuff starts falling off your body. It's bad. And it's contagious. And, and when somebody got leprosy in the old world, what would happen is they would, they would wear rags. After, after they were pronounced unclean by the priest, they would have to leave immediately out of the community. As soon as you, if you went and came to me in the, in the old world, and I'm a priest, and, the, and you come up to get examined, and I look at you and I say, you have leprosy. Immediately. You don't go home to pack your stuff. You don't go home and kiss your wife. You don't go home and hug your kids. You leave. They never see you again unless they see you passing by outside the city. You are relegated to a life outside of community, outside of fellowship. You have no contact with anybody except for maybe another leper you might come across. Literally, your entire physical presence is destroyed. Your, your body begins to become mutilated from the body parts falling off and, and from your, your scars and the de degeneration of your skin. And the bacteria that's eating your body alive smells so bad 
that anybody around you can smell you from a long ways off. And then worse, when somebody would even approach you, as soon as you can see them, you were told to begin to yell, unclean, unclean. In other words, I have leprosy, stay away from me if you don't want to catch it. So people would just move the opposite direction. It was a life of rejection, a life filled with feeling like you were not good enough for anything and wishing that God would just take your life. It was incredibly lonely. There was never anybody to say hi to. Nobody ever to talk to. Nobody ever to, to give a hug or just give you a touch and let you know how, how, that you're worth something. Completely alone. Could you imagine what that would be like? Be like anyone who saw a castaway. Tom Hanks, he's so starving for somebody to talk to. What does he do? He makes Wilson, right? <laughs> and he loves Wilson so much. Get this. He had such a need for contact. He had such a need for relationship, even with something that wasn't alive, that he, when Wilson fell off his raft, risked his life in a storm to try to get his friend back. That's the life of a leper. And this leper comes up to Jesus. Matthew chapter 8. It says, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. And suddenly, a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him and said, Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Now, check this out. Jesus reached out and touched him. He says, I am willing. Be healed. And instantly the leprosy left. You know, in the healing, Jesus declares his healing and, 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 and it brings healing to this man instantly. But, but I want you to understand the healing started when he just touched him. Who knows how long it had been since the last time he was touched by another person. And he was a man who wasn't afraid of what he had. He wasn't afraid of what he could catch. He wasn't afraid of what this man came from or what sin brought him into this place. He only cared about him right now. I will. Jesus is always reaching out to those outsiders who are rejected and judged by society. That doesn't mean that, that if you're rich or famous or, you know, if you've got a nice sweet bank account or if you're, if you're well-educated or, or whatever, if you look good on the outside, I, what I do know, because I was one of those guys where, where somebody once said about me, if God can save David, Eric can save anybody, because it looked like on the outside I had it all together but they didn't know the, the hole in my heart that I needed Jesus for. See, all of us inside are rejected and broken. But, but Jesus comes to everybody with his compassion and his love to let you know you're not rejected by him. <laughs> it's time for us, it's time for us, church. It's time for us to set aside every image of the angry God who sits in heaven waiting for you to mess up so he can just beat the snot out of you. It's time for that to die. It's time to see him as he is, a loving father. The greatest story maybe to ever illustrate that is the prodigal son. Just to sum it up really quick, Here's a son who rejects his father and takes him for all that he's got. He wants his portion. He's like, Dad, I'm not willing to wait for my inheritance until you die. I want it now. In that, he, he literally is saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I just want my stuff. You mean nothing to me. Your money does. He gets his money. He leaves. He leaves his father. 
blows the money on wild living, the scripture says. He ends up destitute, broke. It says that right after he spent all his money, the, the, a famine comes, take it, brings him to the place of such poverty that, that this good Jewish boy is feeding pigs. And not only that, he decides to make them his dinner partners. He's eating their food with them. And all of a sudden, he comes to the realization that even the servants in my father's house eat better than this. So I'll go back and I'll just tell my dad, I'm not worthy to be your son, but could you hire me? Could you hire me as just a servant? And so he makes his way back. And the scriptures say this. It says, as soon as the father saw him, as soon as the father saw him afar off, he ran to him. See, there's people in this room right now. Maybe you knew the Lord at one point in your life and you've walked off and you've done stupid stuff and you've, you've been all kinds of different places and your testimony is not far off from his. You've taken everything that God gave you, all the gifts, all the talents, all the, the blessings, and you, you've blown them in wild living. You've, you've, you've blown up your life. And you think, God will never. Maybe I can just barely make it into heaven. Maybe I can just, if I can just, if I can just, Just enter the gates, Lord. Today, he wants you to know, no matter where you are, if that's you or if you've never known the Lord, he wants you to know this. No matter what your life looks like, he's waiting. He's waiting at the gates for you. He's waiting right now to to just see you make the move to him. And he's going to run to you. He's going to run to you. And he's going to bring healing. And he's going to cover you with his love, he's going to cover you and declare that you are more than just a servant in the house. You're his son. You're his daughter. Because he loves you. He loves you. Remember, Paul wants us to know who God is. This is who he is. Scripture says in 1 John, God is love. Today, I want to invite you into his love. Because if you enter into his love, you'll never find his judgment. If you enter into his love, you'll never taste of his judgment. Let me pray for you. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray for, Lord, our entire congregation here at New Life. Lord, people who are going to watch on the internet later. Everybody, Lord, who's heard this message, I pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, just the revelation of your love would come. That we would, Lord, not not know about it, not, not just know it in facts, but that we would know it in our hearts, that we would find, find that we know that you love us that you don't reject us, that you never say to us, get away from me, that you're always saying, let me love you. In Jesus' name. If there's anybody in this room today who either, either feels like you need, you need that revelation of God's love, maybe you're saved, you've been living for God for a long time or maybe just a couple weeks, but you need that revelation of his love. I want you to, to, to just get up right now, get up and just ask him for it. For anybody else who maybe has never allowed for Jesus to come into your life to be your savior, or maybe you did a long time ago, but you need to recommit, I want you guys, I want you guys to pray with me, and then I want you to come forward and let me pray for you. Let the, the ministerial staff pray for you, because we want God to begin to push into your life past all of the junk that you would find him truly in his love. So anybody who wants to commit to the Lord for the first time or or rededicate your life, pray with me right now. Make this prayer your own. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Lord, everything I've ever done wrong, I, I ask you to forgive me. I give you all of my sin and and I ask you to take it from me. 
Thank you for dying for, for those sins so that I'm, I don't have to carry them anymore. Let me be free. In Jesus' name, I ask you, be my Savior. Be my King. Be my Lord. And let me know you truly. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, why don't you just lift a hand for a second. Let me just see. If anybody prayed that prayer? Okay, we've got a couple. Anybody else who wants to really step into this? I want you to come forward today. I don't ask you to come forward much. I'm asking you today to come forward because we corporately need to know him need to receive the spirit of revelation and understanding so that we can step in to what he has for us. So right now, let's stand up. The band's going to sing and play. I want us to come forward. up gang I'm asking everybody to come members of your family link up with them just right now just reach out to God just let him just begin to minister to you right now just let him touch you let him love you let him love you let him love you Lord Jesus, past every obstacle in our lives, past every, every wrong concept we've ever had about you, Lord, past everything, Lord, strip those things right now. I, I bind right now the effects of, of false doctrine and bad theology. I bind those things and cast them into the abyss. I strip them off of us as a church, and I loose us, Lord, into your presence. And I just ask right now for each person that's here to receive a spirit of revelation and understanding that we would truly know you Lord God, the glorious Father. Let your love just shine down. Let your love just sweep in here. Let us love you and let us let you love us. I rebuke guilt in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of rejection that has been over some of you. I bind it in the name of Jesus and cast it into the abyss. I loose your minds. I loose your hearts. I loose you and declare you free in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Right now, let's just let's just let's just pray for a minute. Just press into that for just a minute. Ask him for what you need from him right now. Ask him, ask him for your part right now. What you need to, to see him as he is, just ask him for. now in the name of Jesus I release you from the spirit of religion I bind that and cast it into the abyss I loose you from the spirit of religion I loose you from all the concepts that are not directly from Jesus Christ I loose you into freedom today in his presence in Jesus name Amen pray for somebody near you just lay hands